Five minutes is polite. I mean, because we have an actual recording set up this time, I guess you can feel free to start. Right, that's a good point. Uh, Alright. So today I want to present to you the paper Go Wide and Surf Deeper. But then, right off the bat, we have to kind of uh, make some clarifications. Because in this paper, what they mean by wider and deeper isn't the usual understanding. But by deeper, they don't actually mean the depth of the model, so like the number of layers. What I mean instead is the uh, number of blocks with separate parameters. So if you have weight sharing, so like 100 layers, and every one of these has the same weight, then in that terminology, you would have basically just one layer that's replicated, so like a depth of one. Um, and then similarly, uh, they also say that you can scale up the width um, of the model by adding mixture of experts or basically anything else, um, which implies that by width they simply mean the number of parameters within one block rather than the actual feed forward width. Um, so actually in one case talk about decreasing feed forward width and increasing mixture of experts, uh, number of experts, uh, and still making it wider. Uh, so this is kind of a bit against what most people are doing, but that's just terminology in this particular paper. Um, right. So then a large part of the paper is just uh, them kind of saying where they're coming from. Um, but as this seems a lot like a um, kind of post-talk motivation uh, that I just put into the introduction, uh, we'll go back uh, over the... Um, analysis later on um, we'll kind of see um, how everything performs like if you just take things out right uh, but uh, we won't just uh, I don't know say how it works with and without makeshift sure experts before actually looking at what makeshift sure experts is and so on uh, and in this uh, first figure you can actually already see a large part of what's going on um, because with the layer norm for example you can see it's placed in front of the makeshift sure experts in front of the multi head attention so using um, PNOM, and similarly, you can also see that the layer norms uh, are um, kind of they have a subscript, and uh, I believe it's called superscript, right? Like the top one. Um, so the attention one and the mixture of experts one, they have different weights, and then additionally, every one of these Sonoma blocks also has different weights or layer norms. So it, these are always different layer norms. However. Mixture of experts and more than attention do not have any of these uh, scripts, so these are always shared. So it's not just the mixture of experts that's shared; it's also multi head attention that's shared, and there is no ablation for um, not sharing multi head attention. However, this is just kind of the paper we're working with, and then on the right hand side, right, you can just see the uh, standard uh, mixture of experts router uh, mechanism. Um, in this particular case, they're using uh, usually four experts, um, and then they're just using kind of the old um, baseline uh, gating mechanism from the initial mixture of experts paper with uh, top two gating, which means that obviously, like a model with um, the same, like if you just add mixture of experts to it, right, let's say 100 experts, uh, is not going to be the same speed, it's going to be half the speed, right? So some of these uh, experiments later on are going to be a bit unfair, but you could probably optimize that using like switch or soft mode or something. Um, right, so then immediately uh, they're kind of jumping into the results. And here we can see that uh, VOT mixture of experts, uh, the big model, right, is kind of, uh, hold on here, uh, this one is kind of outperforms uh, uh, wide net. And then similarly, the uh, large model, right, the VAT model, at some point, um, it kind of underperforms that wide net. But then here, it is also important to note that they actually re-implemented VAT, uh, VAT, um, MOE. These are all their own implementations. They're all trained using the same framework. And then the hyperparameters are actually only tuned for VAT, big and large. And then afterwards, they're kind of transferred to all other models, uh, which means these models did not see their own tuning, and it could be that they just need vastly different learning rates, for example. Um, 
So all these examples, uh, all of these runs are a bit difficult to evaluate. And here it's again uh, VOT MOE is just the baseline VOT MOE model. I'm unfortunately not fully aware of the architecture. Uh, WideNet would be four experts, as discussed previously. Um, right, and then additionally, WideNet B is uh, actually has a lower weight dimension, so it's uh, thirty. So it's 3072 instead of 4096. So why not be in this case, right, isn't even comparable because the models are just like different. Um, it is unclear what I've done that. Um, like they've said, it's for hardware efficiency. It just practically uh, shouldn't be a big difference, uh, especially given that one of them already worked. Um, Right, then they also kind of further validated these claims on uh, just basic NLP modeling. Here again, they have re implemented Albert and Bird for efficiency. They've actually not done the usual Bird style training, but rather they have uh, used factorized embeddings as they used in Albert and then simply copied the hub parameters exactly as they are in Albert to all other models. Um, so that kind of means that the Bird numbers are right there, not comparable with anything else. Um, the, the numbers kind of you just have to take them as well. Uh, however, what this does show is that um, with the equal compute for like four, eight, sixteen experts, right? We can see that simply making the model wider, having more experts in pre-training on C4 and then later on uh, evaluating on all of these kind of smaller data sets, um, adding more experts actually kind of helps. However, uh, as we've seen earlier, right, kind of the weight sharing here um, seems to help at some scale, according to them, right, uh, at the large scale. Um, what they then try to figure out is kind of where does overfitting come from, um, assuming it even is overfitting. Like, why does the VOT MOE L suddenly underperform their model? So, what they did next is just uh, scaling up the number of experts on standard ImageNet. And here they saw that uh, if you only do pre-training on ImageNet with like some basic augmentations from inceptions like 2014, um, the training accuracy keeps on increasing, whereas the test accuracy keeps on decreasing. And the interesting thing to notice here, right, that uh, this is all with, I believe, a 12-layer model. Technically, a number of experts of 12, right, would be roughly the baseline. However, the test accuracy keeps on decreasing, which means the model capacity, at least that's what they're saying, cap uh, keeps on increasing. The model is able to fit the training data a lot better. But at the same time, it also just with more experts memorizes much more. And it's just a bit difficult to say where it's coming from. Uh, one thing that they're suggesting is that the uh, individual experts don't see kind of enough uh, diverse representations. And this is what they then evaluated next. So here you can see. Um, where they changed the number of groups. And the groups is just a new metric they uh, made up themselves. And groups basically means if you have, uh, in this case, a VIT with 12 layers, uh, with 12 groups, each layer would have its own gating. Whereas with three groups, you would kind of have every uh, number of layers divided by three, a new gating. So every four layers, you would have a new uh, matrix of experts gating. And then, kind of what they've pointed out here, right, or like what's relatively visible in the chart is that if you don't have uh, all of this gating at every layer, the model can still learn during training relatively fine. Like, obviously, it's a bit worse, but it can still learn. But then what they assume is that uh, even if the training is fine, it struggles during testing because the experts haven't seen uh, very diverse uh, representations of tokens. Um, so this kind of diversity is what they're introducing with this, uh, by just having the normal routing, right? Rather than like pairing the routers to, uh, or the routing itself, not the routers, right? The routers are shared. Um, but then, damn it. Right, this had further implications, but I forgot them right now, so let's just continue looking at the next uh, table. Uh, 
the next table here is just uh, them doing more experiments with WhiteNet, just some simple ablations. And here it is uh, very important to note that uh, they're kind of doing um, progressive uh, removal. So WhiteNet B, right, would be the baseline. And then it's with shared layer norm, right, because WhiteNet previously, as we established, does not have a shared layer norm. It's kind of all untied as in the baseline. Um, so sharing the layer norm is worse but then here when they say without a mixture of experts layer right what they mean is with shared layer norm but without mixture of experts so basically everything's weight shared and that um they get a nan and that is yeah, kind of unfortunate uh and then again kind of further progressive right um now we have no parameter sharing, it's just the straight up baseline model, uh, which would be quite similar to vision transformer, likely. Um, like again, different because they for wide net V uh, chose to use a smaller uh, feed uh, dimension. Um, and then you can see right here kind of outperforms um, or like wide net underperforms the baseline, but then again later on uh, it kind of just gets better. But it is diff difficult to compare because the mixture of experts implementation kind of has, again, the 2x slowdown due to the uh, routing they use. And then additionally, they have the 1.2x capacity, which means that, like, in total, it should be just mixture of experts part should be 2.5x uh, slower so than normal feed forward. And in the last table, they're actually kind of discussing that a little bit. So I find the line here kind of between the top and the bottom group is a bit difficult because the two models I left, uh, I love to compare is just the um, topmost vision transformer and then the bottommost wide net because these both have the same uh, depth and the same feed forward dimension and that's right the, that's the baseline vision transformer which gets to 77 million uh, percent top one accuracy uh, and then we have the uh, wide net L at 79.5 right so that's Obviously, a massive gain, but then um, obviously the time has also significantly increased due to their routing mechanism. But this routing could again be alleviated, and uh, in my kind of re implementation, that also like, I didn't use that routing and it was much better. Right, thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um, okay, so there are kind of a few questions in the reading group thread, if mm -hmm. you'd like to read them, or... Sorry? There are a few questions in the MOA oh, reading. I... Yes. Right, of course. Right, so they don't quite explain why separate learn is necessary. Uh, they have some analysis on that. Um, where well, they, uh, yeah, they simply say kind of diverges, and uh, they also argue that um, it diversifies the representations, which kind of means that you can then later on have different inputs to the mixture of experts, like different domains, basically, which makes it a lot easier for it to learn, rather than always getting like very similar tokens. Um, but it is unclear if that is actually the case, and. Additionally, given that the uh, layer norm isn't that expensive to not share, right, it's probably fine. It just, you can't really use it in something like pondering it now. Um, where does, do you mean in this paper, where vid B, or like in this slide, where vid B would outperform vid L? Like, yeah, that is weird. Oh, probably also the earlier one, right? Right, so uh, this is all their implementation. It's not the actual vision of Solar stuff. Um, so what's happening here is that it is significantly under-regularized because they have simply copied the uh, data set from uh, a 2014 paper, which means all of these things from like uh, DID and, well, vision of Solar, right, where they just tell you how to trade it, uh, that's not in there. Um, so this could technically just be a way of regularizing the model, 
it could also be that you know it actually helps it's like with uh sharpness that were memorization right where technically maybe it works but practically you know not so much right so they don't make any losses flop sorry uh, the question I was interested in is if they make any comparison of losses flops in the training. It seems likely that the widener requires much more flops to obtain the same amount of losses as a normal model. So, no, there's no flop comparison. However, there's a time comparison at the end, right? And uh, there, again, it is important to note that they're using top two routing uh, with a large capacity factor. So, technically, if you were to use something like soft MOE or uh, then the times would likely be at least roughly equal. Uh, and in that case, right, it seems like a pretty much free gain, especially given that there's already a mixture of experts implementations which, kind of, which outperform the old ones. Um, but again, the entire data thing is a bit difficult, so kind of we have no real baseline to compare to. It's only just within this paper. Um, the optimizers are largely untuned, and yeah, it it is just difficult to compare. Do you have any idea why nobody else pursued um, this widener idea? Because this paper has been out for about two years, right? Right. No, I have no idea. Like I did it right, and probably also yeah, I wrote it down somewhere. But uh, yeah, I have not seen it anywhere else. Like not on Twitter, not anywhere. I, mean, I don't even know if the papers like citations. Do you generally like vibe check? Do you feel this paper is like worth trying to reproduce? So like, you do you think that there's potentially some unstated or insufficiently exposed limitation with the um, idea employed in the paper? Right. So I think the motivation the experiments are definitely interesting, but. I don't quite agree with them. I'm mostly very excited that someone tested this, ex uh, this idea of weight sharing mixture of experts layers, and that like that they say okay is at least not worse, right? Uh, made me try it myself, and then obviously I saw it, it's good. Um, and like the idea, right? If you, if you just think about it, uh, is basically right. If you have let's say sixteen layers. Um, with 16 different feed forward layers, uh, what you're now doing is you're kind of unraveling them or like putting them uh, rather than in sequence, you're putting them in parallel, and the model just picks for every single token which of these 16 feed forward layers it wants, right? And then you do that selection algorithm 16 times, or like n times, rather than you know always having the same feed forward applied for every single token. So I think. Like, in theory, right, it is very elegant, it's just they don't talk about any of these things in the paper. Forgive me for my lack of knowledge, but do you have any idea what the training memory characteristics for this recurrent transformer looks like? Like, is, is it just a, simply the, uh, is the calculation identical to that of a normal transformer where you just take the number of parameters multiplied by a constant that is like around 12 bytes per parameter? Right, so uh, you would have all that stuff and then on top obviously the hidden state too, right? Um, so they say they're training on uh, TPU uh, v v3-256 which is pretty large, and I also say that some of their models even ran out of memory. Uh, hold on, this one. Uh, why not H and out of memory? Um, well, the one without parameter sharing, right? Um, but there it's uh, obviously also a bit difficult to say because they have a re-implementation in TensorFlow, and if they ran out of memory, then that means that they uh, kind of ran all these experiments on uh, one TPU core at a, uh, at a time and just ran um, kind of a global or reduce of the gradients, um, which is definitely not the case in a JAX implementation. Right. Like, you can't train a 22 billion parameter vision transformer on one TPU core. Well, uh, I can't.
Right, so about this, um, what they're saying, right, kind of the reason why they're uh, weight sharing too, so not just the uh, grouping, but also the weight sharing is so important, is because uh, of precisely this diversity of the token representations. So um, here they're saying that uh, due to like having a higher group number, right, so like all the way on the left, with the baseline where you do rerouting at every layer rather than all the way on the right, right, where you would do two routings for the entire model, um, irrespective of the depth, and then just kind of keep the same expert selection for uh, six layers, right, and then kind of reroute and use the same expert selection for, for the other six layers. Um, what they say is that by doing these groups, right, or like keeping it rewriting at every layer with the same experts, uh, the experts kind of get more gradient signal, more diverse token information. So you could technically also just get this with a massive batch size. Or if you don't want to, right, if you maybe can't afford a massive, a massive batch, don't, yeah, otherwise, like, don't see batches in, let's say, layer norm or so, from using massive batches and all that, right? Uh, you could also use the weight sharing here, and then with the weight sharing, you kind of just have this times many, uh, like let's say 16 layers, right? You have 16 times more uh, four passes into the experts, and therefore, obviously, you have more uh, gradient information, more diverse gradients, which kind of help with the convergence and the generalization. Cool. And this is kind of what I've taken away here, too, from this stuff. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask, is the routing a relatively cheap operation um, compared to everything else? Uh, so the routing cool. is, but the balancing isn't. So uh, I don't know if there's good. like... So I don't know how the balancing works in the new uh, JAX implementations. Uh, but I know that in the old mesh TensorFlow stuff, right, like when the code base was still normal T5, um, that you had like thousands of lines literally just for one routing implementation and that would do stuff like uh come some across devices and so on and come some itself would also just be another big mud mall and essentially you're doing like uh or of n squared where n is number of experts uh sized mud malls and then yeah also like tons of tiny ops and tiny ops are always expensive and then all of this is also again sequential so you just the model can't do anything while you have these uh tiny sequential ops of like sorting and all these things right running um so you're just essentially waiting uh and therefore while it technically isn't expensive for <laughs> gpus it probably wouldn't be uh on tpus the routing itself is actually a massive part of the time so in my case by simply removing the routing right just like going with uh hash layers for example I sped up my entire bottle about 2x. Okay, that makes sense. I, I could imagine the implementation complexity along with TPU constraints could make it more expensive. But in principle, yeah. it sounds like it ought not necessarily to be expensive. Right, yeah. I mean, you just technically need to uh, have these assignments, right? The softmax assignments and then uh reduce those and afterwards uh do some quick balancing uh, like for the capacity factor right for that you need the balancing to re have the drop off of where the dropped tokens go and all the things that was kind of the expensive part the balancing itself was just a loss right um yeah but stuff like soft MOE, for example, would also completely alleviate that. And with soft MOE, you also don't have the uh, additional time constraints. Um, like in that case, right, of using twice as much time. So that would likely be a very attractive combination. And yeah, especially given that they're using vision almost. Are you Sorry? working on any um, MOE models? Like because you, it sounds like you have a lot of prior past experience with training um, MOE architectures, right. I guess. So about half a year ago, uh, I had a language modeling project, which ran for, I believe, two years, 
or two and a half. Um, had well, we're really being picky stray years, but uh, that thing um, well didn't co uh, kind of turn out that well. Uh, so while I do have lots of mixture of experts experience and all that, it's uh, there's very few actual ablations, so it's a bit like difficult to actually put it into uh, words of what would be acceptable. Like, um, Sorry. Um, now, now there, there are several like, um, like for example, the Open MOE project is dropping up, and like they're trying to train their own models. So like, are, are there any like lessons you, you would want to talk about from your prior experience with training all oh, right that that just today. like in a read me uh, i don't remember much of that though because again it's okay. been over half a year like i've i'm now working on vision models inspired by the new cortex mm. <laughs> yeah um uh, I mean, it is so quite cool from i love science in the web now Right, thank you. Um, maybe this is obvious, or you mentioned it already, but if the first block, uh, it goes to expert one, second block, it goes to expert two, etc., doesn't it become standard transformer? And if so, what presents it from degrading to into the scenario? Um, right, so technically, it would become a standard transformer, but it can still do degating as it wants to, right? So in this case, it would just say, I want to become a standard transformer. And then they have um, a noise on top of the routing because they use more of these old routing mechanisms which kind of don't have all of these uh, amazing uh, balancing things. Uh, like a... Never mind. Uh, and this noise is just an exploration noise to kind of stop it from degrading initially uh, or like from locking on to one expert. But then additionally, you have the capacity factor which means that if you have more than 20% uh, more tokens than allowed, um, so like 120% of the tokens the expert would be allowed to get, and then you're just kind of dropping the last tokens. That will mean if you have, let's say, a sequence of uh, a thousand, and then for experts, right, each expert is kind of expected to get 256 tokens, then with the uh, top two routing, that will mean, you know, you get these 512 tokens, but then, like, one of them is top one, the other is top two. Um, and then, on top of that, right, you have the 20%, so that would be, like, 600-ish. Um, so, technically, it is, in some of the cases, possible for the model to route most of the stuff through one or two experts, but practically, right, it's you have the balancing loss and so on, it's kind of not there. Uh, but that's also the case with, let's say, switch and so on, where the model could technically choose to use, let's say, one expert all the, in all the entire time, or, you know, going, like, straight through. Uh, but due to the balancing loss and these capacity constraints, you always have different uh, expert selections in each layer. I hope the rambling made at least some sense. Yeah, I expect that with the balancing losses and the constraints applied per layer, it's not going to route, or it will be infeasible for it to route all tokens to in the first layer to the first M expert, all tokens in the second layer to the second expert, and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I think that case should be avoided by design. Right, like, it is not possible for it to route everything to one expert and then the second expert. But it could technically just round 50% of the tokens there. Um, this scenario doesn't use only one or two experts, though, right? I'm not sure if the loss helps this. No. I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. I think this is just saying that if the number of the, if the depth or the so called number of layers is fewer than the uh it's larger than the number of experts, you can't fall into the case where all the yeah, the model just selects one expert per layer because you have 
view experts, then you have layers. Um, it, just another way of avoiding the, the case that um, Tanishka is uh, pointing out. All right. Thank you for the explanation. And then, wouldn't it be trivially not to be, so wouldn't it trivially not be a tri assumption, so I'm assuming depth greater than num experts are? That's what you just talked about, right? Right, yeah, so we the depth is significantly larger. It can't kind of fall back uh, to that, and this is also what they saw here. Well, like what we kind of discussed earlier a bit here, um, because this is, I believe, on VIT Big, which is 12 layers. Um, and here they say using four experts actually kind of well in training not being ideal in eval outperforms all the other things. But then again, it is difficult to say that because they also note that uh, the key benefit of what they're experiencing is just the improved uh, data, like that you can get more or less data. And then at the same time, they're now saying here that all the experiments were done using low augmentation uh, image net 1K training, which is where we already know VIT doesn't quite excel. So what would be like the, the kind of uh, minimum experiment that you think would be sufficient to verify that this idea actually works and that the, the results that they show are just due to the quirks of their data set and their lack of hyperparameter tuning? Honestly, just put it on the pile. like. Yeah. Okay, but, but with what size model? I mean, when I publish stuff about my model finding, it was called out using models less than 2 billion parameters, so I'm going to say 2 billion parameters. Uh, and then also, I believe, like, less than 20B was at least, I believe, two and a half years ago considered to be bad practice, so also 2 B, uh, 20 billion tokens. Um, and yeah, I think that's, like, definitely a feasible size. Do they provide any um, implementation of white net like? Um, I have not looked into that, but it's relatively trivial to implement, right? It's just your white train kind of the mix of experts layer, and I wouldn't yeah. honestly share the attention. I don't see why I did that. But yeah, you just have to kind of wait, share the weights here, and if your framework supports it, like in PyTorch, right? Where yeah. you just kind of reuse the layer as probably doable. Why would you choose to not share the attention weights as well? Like, what is the intuition? I mean, it's not done by default on the baseline, right? So just, this would be a bit of an innovation, just to see if, like... Well, maybe it's uh, better too, right? But, you know, they just change one thing at a time. That makes sense. They are sharing their attention weights, no? Yeah, yeah, they are. He, he said that he's saying that it would be oh. better for ablation if if the only thing that they shared was the P port. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. I, I There's also results they can cross refer from Albert, which shows that, yeah, sharing attention hurts minimally, at least at the sizes that they're testing. Um, One thing I'll throw in is, yeah, recently I've been looking at... um layer resharing and actually i was just hinting at oh maybe we should do something like share attention and moe the uh the uh, moe the mlp which ends up being exactly this uh format um the i think a, a bunch of the current sorry, large scale training libraries might not play very nicely with layer sharing uh, yes. off the top of my head deep speed megatron does not like it when you or like does not easily support partially sharing a transformer blocks uh, weights. Um, I'm also, I also don't know how well FSDP would support it out of the box. Uh, so, so that might be one challenge to, um, yeah, to, to, to 
setting this up. Like in principle, you can build it, but like some of the libraries might not support that out of the box. It will be challenging at larger scales, but in order to accomplish the, let's say, two billion parameter experiment, it, you would not need FSDP or H2 or anything other than pure DDP, right? I'm not sure at what scales it the, the other libraries start to benefit. But even something like a zero, zero one or zero two might help at that scale. And I'm trying to think if it may or may not play yeah, nice. It, I'm not sure. It definitely really help because you would be able to increase the mm -hmm. batch size. But it, it won't be necessary technically. You, you, you can probably live with like 30% HFU or utilization with the reduced batch size that you operate on with two billion parameters. Yeah, and in any case, you are more, well, actually, I don't know. You're more memory constrained because you have more hidden states now compared to your usual. Uh, right. Yeah, the usual of hidden states you expect for that number of parameters. That's true. But the hidden states won't be it. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, zero one and zero two and even zero three does not does not fix the and it, it will not target the activations for um for sharding regardless. Yeah, no, it's more that you you have memory savings from all that other stuff, which you will used to you spend on your activations. So I guess it um, kind of balances out. Lucas, would the optimizer store like a like multi it, it wouldn't be storing multiple copies of the of the recurrent layer, right? For no just one, yeah. Yeah, so that would be you know two billion parameter with times one ever, which which would be quite small compared to the I don't know how many repeat the iterations of activations. But then the nice thing about FSTP, for example, I just thought, or like, just the way... Uh... No, actually, FSTP is really bad here, right? Because FSTP operates by, um, it, like, every single layer, right? When it reaches the layer, it all gathers the parameters together. But in this case, we only have one layer. So you all gather the entire, the entire layer, right? So right, it, it's and like, not worth paying the FSTP price. You might as well just keep it on device the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Um, Honestly, I just use model parallel. Like, it's not not bad. Model parallel is pretty good. You just have to use it correctly. Um, Jason, do you um, understand what Mahoko is asking? I think this is about the new paper that I have not read, so I'm not sure if I can speak to it. <laughs> oh, I, I was replying to uh, someone, uh, but I can't quite remember what they said. Uh, so, some, yeah, someone was asking about an ablation. Uh, what, um, why are we only looking at sharing feed forwards? Why not also look at sharing attention projections? Uh, I think they justified it saying that sharing attention projections was okay. Um, did I hear that correctly? Because um, I didn't think sharing them will be okay. I believe, is is the Apple paper referring to Albert? I think I saw Albert mentioned. Yeah, I, I think there's two papers. I think there's the, Albert says that sharing attention is fine. And it sounds like the Apple paper says that sharing FFN is fine. Yes, the, the recent Apple paper, uh, one wide feed former is all you need, um, says that sharing feed forwards um, is uh, fine uh, in, uh, in decoders, sorry, in encoders. And decoders don't need them at all in an encoder decoder model. Um, and encoders in the encoder decoder model can share one. Um, with only a minor accuracy loss, um, 
uh, but that if you make it wider, you can actually outperform the original accuracy. Do you have a link to the paper on hand? I'm struggling to actually find it. Um, sure. I searched for white former, but failed. Uh, here it is. And thank you. Did, do you remember off the top of your head um, what the... They're not doing any mature effects, but it's here, right? They're just using a really wide... Um, before that? Um, yeah, no mixture of experts. Um, they kind of found two things. They found um, even if you don't widen it to share it over all the blocks, um, it's actually not that big of a loss in accuracy. Right. Um, but like the results for encoder decoder models are much better. Um, for for decoder only, you can share it, you can widen it. The accuracy will increase, but um, the latency increases noticeably. Uh, it might not be worth it for decoder only. Yeah, the the, the basis I'm I'm thinking of for these like to give these white model's value is if like at, at really really large scales you you have these models that can't fit on single gpus or like can't fit on entire dgx nodes maybe and then you, you could make the case that maybe if you use these um recurrent layers then you have you need less memory and you can still fit the model within one node and then you don't need to incur the increased training slowdown associated with like like for example, GPT four was trained um, pipeline parallel across multiple DJX nodes, right? So maybe if you could fit it on one node, then you will have more utilization, and then maybe you could train a somewhat smaller model for a much longer duration, and that could could give you a cheaper training ride at the end of the day. But do you know what? Um, Then does does this Apple paper not have any um flux wise comparisons of their training runs as well? Because I feel like that's something that's really important for They mention the speed. Um I don't think they mention flux. What do they mean by speed? Like speed of like iterations per second? I think so. Right. Okay, but but like the the, the speed of training is only in, important insofar as you can get the the same amount of um, reduced loss per training sample. So like I, ideally, what you would get is like the the number amount of loss, so like the duration it takes in order to get to this amount of loss, as as is usually done in the MOE papers or performance comparisons. I uh, I'm not, uh, I'm seeing they're mostly interested in inference speed. So uh, I'm ah. not sure if what they're showing in the tables is telling us the training speed. Yeah, they report inference speed. But I do think um, uh, this this idea of uh, sharing feed forward um, weights over all the blocks. Um, one thing that's underexplored is so we we are seeing um, it's if uh, you need to make it wider to recover the accuracy. But we right. um, we haven't checked. What if in uh, what if sh instead of sharing one uh, feedforward network 
uh, over the model. What if you had like a pool of a few of them? Um, smaller than one per block, but more than one. Uh, I think mi mixture of experts routing could be a really good way to have a small pool of feed forward weights and pick the right one for which block of the transformer you're on. Yeah. And this could solve the, the problem we were discussing of uh, what happens if you make the layers really wide. Uh, we would try to have uh, more of them, but not make them wider. All right, then. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, do we have a paper for next week? So for about the last three weeks or so, I've been saying, oh, I can do the expert choice routing paper the next week. But um, given that this is the paper that we have gone through for this week, is there is there any follow-up paper to this that is related that you might recommend, or is there any other paper in general that you might recommend to go to? I mean, expert choice is pretty cool, and in combination with this one probably too, but I'm not aware of any follow-ups. But there were 36 citations, right? Wait, there are only six citations for which paper? Uh, 36 for this one. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, free AGI pointed out early on. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, next week, I can do the expert choice paper unless um, anyone else like has a paper in mind. Yeah, that, that'll be a default for next week. So, see you, guess. Okay, yeah, can you drop the link of the paper in the chat? Uh, sure, I will. Goodbye, guys. Goodbye.